This is defending the Immaculate. Together, we defend the honor of our Blessed Mother. The Virgin Mary as full of grace. Why would this make her immaculate, free from sin, from the first moment of her conception and her entire life? This is a big one. This is a big one because many people think that the argument for the Immaculate Conception of Mary can be made entirely from this one claim. Mary is full of grace. And the reason why is through considering St. Paul's understanding, the New Testament understanding, of what it means to be full of grace. Sin is contrasted with grace as its polar opposite. St. Paul describes how there are those under sin and those, the baptized, who are under grace. The state of sin that we are born in is the source of our continued struggle against sin. The Psalms talk about this. In sin I was conceived. And the person struggles as a result of being born in sin. Ephesians talks about this and explains how grace is the remedy, gradually overcoming sin through grace. Ordinarily, sanctification, another word for that process of being filled with grace, is only completed in eternal life, in heaven. We read St. Paul describing this journey. He says to the baptized but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of god the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life so eternal life the life of heaven that is the full flowering of sanctification of being filled with grace someone full of grace, if someone is called full of grace, it would signify that that individual has been completely transformed, that they have, following the words of Ephesians, put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. St. Paul in Ephesians is telling people to try and live like that, but he knows that this is a struggle to try and put on the new self. Someone who has reached the end of sanctification will have reached the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Finally, Christ is the source of grace. We receive from his fullness. So a sign of an individual being full of grace would be for that individual to be defined alongside Christ as like graced, like blessed, or like holy. This would be a further signification that that individual is full of grace. They've drunk from Christ to, to their full. They've drunk from his holiness to their the full of their human capacity. And this would show that that individual now stands apart from sin, has a complete conformity to Christ, the conformity of a saint, even in this world. Someone who ordinarily, who's reached the life of heaven, has this holiness. But if an individual is full of grace, then they would have this, this sinlessness, this moral perfection in this life. Let's look at the evidence. Hell full of grace, the Lord is with you. Many people could just end this video now and close the whole series. We found it. Hell full of grace. The Lord is with you. It's the only time in the Bible that 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 set of words is used. The only only individual who receives this greeting is the Virgin Mary. Kyrie kakaratomine. Literally, it means hell, O graced one. O one filled with grace. Hail, O grace filled one. 
and I'm adding the o there because normally kairé, an honorific greeting, a good a, a good greeting, a respectful greeting, is followed by a person's name. That's how it works in scripture. But in this case, this singular case, we don't have Hail Mary. Instead, we have Hail O One filled with grace. Hail O Grace filled one. That's her title. That isn't that isn't just a, a description of how how nice a person she is or how favored she's been by God in her life. Though the angel is referring to her by the title of who she is in the very core of her being. She's very special. She's the grace-filled one. And looking back on the previous slide, that means that she, the grace-filled one, has completed, is at the complete point in terms of moral perfection in this world. And the angel re-echoes it by saying, the Lord is with you. Some further evidence we can see in Elizabeth's greeting to Our Lady, this likeness to Christ that St. Paul talks about, you know, he talks about the aim the saints will be will have received will have achieved a perfection so that they'll be conformed fully conformed to the image of the sun and elizabeth's greeting suggests this conformity blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb co-blessed the woman and the fruit our lady is special she has achieved this conformity. God has given her this conformity to the image of the son, her son, in this life. A co-blessedness. Not a diminutive for Our Lady here and a greater for Our Lord, but a simple reality that she is, she is immaculate. She's like Christ in holiness in blessedness because she's received from his fullness to the full degree of human capability our lady herself therefore re-echoes this saying in her magnificat henceforth all generations will call me blessed maybe a comparison with eve here eve the one who was cursed and brought upon the curse of humanity here Virgin Mary, full of grace. Eve, the one who brought in sin. Our Lady, the blessed one, who is filled with grace. A repetition of this point made by St. Luke is found in our Lord's saying about the tree. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is a fruit of your womb. Our Lady is that perfect tree to give birth to the divine fruit. Blessed are you among women. Blessed is a fruit of your womb. Our Lord's words seem to expect that Our Lady is going to be immaculate. If she is going to give birth to the sinless fruit, she'll be the sinless, perfect tree. Of course, we don't need to apply this back to Our Lady's mother, Saint Anne, and back and back and back, because only Our Lord is a divine one. And the Immaculate Conception, Our Lady's sin free from being free from sin, is of course ordered towards the fact that she is the only individual in the whole of creation, the whole of history, who will bear the Almighty into the world. So it's befitting for her to be the immaculate tree giving birth to the immaculate fruit. And finally, St. Matthew in this verse, talking of the three holy kings at Bethlehem, going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Again, this is showing 
a likeness between our Lord and the Virgin Mary because the gospel writer doesn't tell us of Saint Joseph and Saint Joseph was there. Saint Joseph was there looking after them, the protector of the Holy Family. But the gospel writer doesn't need to tell us about that. He wants to single out the fact that the wise men, they knelt down before Jesus and Mary together. They worshiped Jesus, but they knelt down before the two of them. Saint Joseph is excluded from the picture here because in spite of his, his great holiness, surely he's not the immaculate. The gospel writer wants to show us the special significance of Our Lady holding our Lord, with our Lord, the immaculate tree, the immaculate fruit. She is the immaculate. May the immaculate Virgin Mary intercede for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.